Bowser. Me, Mario. Yahoo! Woohoo! Let's go. Let's have fun. Nintendo. Oh yeah. Good morning, everyone. Happy November on this great Friday. How's everybody doing today? How are you, Josh? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself, Chris? Not too bad, not too bad. Uh, so today, once again, it is just going to be Josh and me. Uh, Noah, unfortunately, um, had a couple of things that kind of uh, took precedent, so he won't be joining us today. But um, for now, we do have uh, just Josh and me, so... We're going to roll on and uh, continue on as normal with our show. Uh, I believe Josh has got us some music for today, so I'm going to pass him the the power of the music. And turn down the music powerful uh, knob there, and we will uh, get rolling with, with the show and the music. So today's uh, selection of music is from uh, The Legend of a uh, kind of... It's kind of fitting for what we've uh, what we did, and uh, Josh and I went to the Legend of Zelda Symphony on Wednesday, and we went and experienced that, and that was a good show. Um, so we've got quite a few topics that we got to go over this week. I'll, uh, as always, uh, we do have our Facebook page, uh, Nintendo Bros, and our YouTube channel, Nintendo Bros Show. Go ahead and like and subscribe to us on those respectively. And the music has begun. Uh, thank you, Josh. Mm-hmm. Yep, and uh, I have just uploaded a the uh, segment of Name That Song, so we'll probably post that to the Facebook page. And for everyone that you know had played along, uh, you know, go ahead and write down your responses and type them in, and uh, we'll kind of go from there and see what everyone did with that. Mm-hmm. So, um, as always. Uh, and we continue to repeat this every show, and it's usually something that we have to re- repeat so that we don't get uh, get followed by the the big end. Uh, we are not endorsed by Nintendo, and these are our own opinions and our own uh, thoughts on the topics that we talk about in the show. All right, so on to the first topic: Black Friday. That's coming up here pretty soon. Nintendo has actually uh, tossed out um, two pretty cool bundles. Uh, involving Zelda and that one is uh, the first one is the Breath of the Wild Explorers Edition which is the Switch version of the game and it's going to come with a two-sided map and a 100 page Explorers Guide with that and that's going to be priced at $59.99 on Black Friday so definitely a good deal for anyone that has not already picked up Breath of the Wild uh, that's mm-hmm. going to be you know you're going to get the map with it you're going to get the you know 100 pages guide you know you're going to be able to go find all those Korok seeds great thing, you know, and it's going to be basically just the price of the game. And yep. Uh, also, we've got The Legend of Zelda uh, Ocarina of Time, the 2DS, so they have a 2DS bundle for uh, Ocarina of Time 3D uh, with the game, so you'll get that for uh, $79.99 on Black Friday, so that's a pretty good... Pretty good deal. I'm glad uh, Nintendo's kind of throwing that out there, especially to see kind of Ocarina of Time coming back again. We did see it come back for uh, the Nintendo Classic, The you know, their special selects and then uh, the Nintendo selects, um, but glad to see it coming back again one more time. Uh, Ocarina of Time is just a phenomenal game for whoever has not played it yet. Uh, definitely a game to play. Indeed, uh, and it kind of it's one of those pivotal games in the the Zelda timeline that we hear about all the time. So it'll be something that we'll have to. Uh, if you haven't played it, you're kind of missing a big chunk of the story, uh, the official story, I should say. Mm-hmm. But aside from that, we do have some more Pokemon Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon, uh, and Pokemon Sun and Moon news. Um, of course, you do have your last chance to redeem those codes for the Mega Stones. Uh, those codes are in all caps: Intimidate, Azul, A Z U L, Matsubusa, Sublevelent, Poyong, and Drachi. And those will actually allow you to get uh, a lot of Mega Stones for over 25 different Pokemon. So if you haven't already in uh, Sun and Moon and you you have those different Pokemon, uh, go and get those stones before uh, the event is up, and then you can Mega Evolve your uh, Pokemon in that game. So 
And we we have no information about what this is going to be, but apparently there's going to be a news update for Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon on November 10th. So, looking forward to that, and that's just going to be a week away from launch, so who knows what they might drop with us. They might give us a new trailer, do something, but they're going to give us a whole bunch of more information and probably some of everything that they've kind of come out with already, uh, which is quite a lot, actually, before the game has already come out, so... Looking forward to uh, seeing that coming up here soon. Um, in an interview with GameSpot, uh, the director of the game... Um, Kazumasa Iwao. Yeah, he was... Uh, they went over kind of a couple topics about uh, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, and, you know, kind of a topic that they kind of brought up um, was kind of picking the right game, you know, for you. Which one would you, you know, would help... You know, benefit towards whatever one you you know you would try to lean towards, and um, basically he said that the you know Pokedex in Ultra Sun is based off the one in in Pokemon Sun, and it's going to be the same for you know Ultra Moon and Moon. Um, so if you really want to get completion of the Pokedex, you should probably get the other game because of the fact that you know you're going to be able to get you know the counter uh, Pokedex ones, the special ones that. You know, are in those specific games. So if you haven't, so like me, since I got Moon, I'm probably gonna get Ultra Sun. Or if you're like me and you've already pre-ordered both and you have both paid off, you know, you're not gonna have to worry about it. Then, you, yeah. you don't have to worry about it at all. Yeah, another t- another point that he uh, that uh, they pointed out um, is if you're looking for a kind of like stories based for those who you know played Pokemon Sun. Um, and you really want to go for Ultra Sun, you know, there's going to be some details that kind of remain the same between the, uh, both, you know, both the same games, so I'm assuming, like, you know, obviously the time thing is going to be, uh, you know, the same, obviously. Right. And, then, you know, they said you know, a few different things, you know, for a, you know, looking forward to a story-based game that you're going to see kind of similarities between the same games, so if you're kind of looking for that, you would, you know, you should be getting probably more or less the same one, um, but if you're looking to complete that Pokedex, you know, if you're just getting one game, go ahead and, you know, go ahead and get the opposite one, so. And, of course, um, with those Ultra Wormholes, it has been confirmed that you'll be able to catch mythical Pokemon from that. So the legendaries that Ultra Sun has been confirmed to have are Ho-Oh, Raikou, Groudon, Latios, Dialga, Heatran, Reshiram, Tornadus, and Xerneas. And then Ultra Moon for the legendaries has Lugia, Entei, uh, Kyogre, Latias, uh, Palkia, Regigigas, Zekrom, uh, Thunderous, and Yveltal. So whoever, you know, if you're looking for those specific uh, legendaries, uh, you can go ahead and get Ultra Moon. And then, of course, with um, all of the the trios that we have, uh, with all of the trios of the legendaries, um, it is an incentive to have both of the both Raikou and Entei for Suicune, both Kyo- Kyogre and Groudon for Rayquaza, uh, both Dialga and Palkia for Giratina, uh, Reshiram and Zekrom for Kyurem, and of course uh, Tornadus and Thunderous for Landorus. So, which kind of keeps to the the trend of those games, um, because of course you had in order to get Rayquaza, you had to have uh, both the both the, uh, Kyogre and Groudon, so you had to have both orbs in order to get the green orb to get Rayquaza. Mm-hmm. So, and they kind of pointed out, like, why, you know, t- making the two versions make sense. Um, and they pointed out that there are some story difference between the two that it kind of leads to a split. Um, and, you know, they wanted to be able to uh, have you catch many more different Pokemon, and there's going to be different characters, you know, in the two stories, you know, between the two games themselves. So there are going to be some, a lot more differences you know, between Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon versus something like Sun and Moon, where you get, you know, the night and day difference, but there's going to be a little bit more of a difference in these games than they ha- there have been of past games, and it's going to help to, you know, draw out the most from the characters in the game, so... And, of course, it harkens back to the original idea of Pokemon was, you know, connect with your friends and trade Pokemon. So it kind of makes sense that they keep the two versions going because you have those version exclusives that encourage the trading amongst friends. Mm -hmm. Or if you're introverted and you don't really go out much, you you buy both versions and you trade with yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a sad existence. (laughs) It's Pokemon Bank. So Yeah. All right. And then... They did come out with a new video of Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, um, where 
we get to see Giovanni strike back. He's going to be fighting you with Mewtwo. And then we got to see the first encounter, like we said last week, but they have their official name now, <laughs> Team Rainbow Rocket. So uh, that's that's uh, that's interesting, I guess. But I, I was kind of thinking about it this morning um, because with this, you're uh, with Team Rainbow Rocket, you're encountering notorious other bosses and legendary Pokemon for the past years of games of Pokemon. So I, it's a combination of all these different teams. So I guess you throw in all the colors, and I guess you get a rainbow. So I mean, I, I think that kind of makes make, that kind of makes sense, I guess. But I, I don't know. It sounds just but, weird. But. but who's the leader? That's the question. Huh. Who's the leader? Because you've got Giovanni, you've got Maxi, you've got Archie, you've yeah. got, you know, Cyrus, Geddes, and now you've got uh, Lysander. Mm-hmm. So you've got a lot of, uh, you got a lot of cooks and not enough, uh, mm-hmm. not enough people to, you know, serve the food. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting, but you're going to be, in, be able to encounter those bosses, um... There is another uh, kind of battle that you're going to be able to do. It's called the you're going to go through the battle agency, um, where I I don't know how I feel about this. You're going to be renting powerful Pokemon and battling one on one. I think you can. I don't know if you can use your own Pokemon, but it well, I, I don't know that that's just weird to me. Well, there was a there was a mechanic all the way back, and when they had the battle, uh, the battle frontier. Okay. There was a location I remember. One of them was I want to say the Battle Factory, and you didn't use your team's Pokemon. You used the team of rented Pokemon to battle through and beat a collection of trainers. So this is kind of bringing back that mechanic from many years back. So this is something that um, this is a throwback while being something new in the same way. Okay. So this is something that you you didn't have an, a chance to experience because you hopped in Excellent. post. Yeah post Gen 4, and it didn't even happen in Gen 5, so you'll have to backtrack a couple of generations to just kind of see how it worked back then. It'll uh-huh. be interesting to see how they do it this time around, but that was how it worked back then. Gotcha. And with this, you're going to be able to bow- uh, battle powerful characters and earn rare items, so it's going to be that's going to be something interesting to kind of look at, and uh, definitely I'm going to have to try out. Uh, well, rare is a relative term, because... Yeah, no. You know, you've got the gene splicer, that's rare. You've got, you know, all those key items. <laughs> yeah, well, but, you know what I mean, yeah. So, uh, another thing that they're going to have in this, in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, is you're going to be searching Alola for totem stickers, which are going to be plastered all around Alola. And from there, you're going to be, uh, you know, collecting a lot of them. It's going to help you get totem sized Pokemon. I don't know what that means. But I have no idea that. Hmm. Even the trailer was a little confusing with that. I I'm not sure about that, but it's something that uh, I guess is different from uh, Sun and Moon. So yay, I guess. But uh, again, another good thing is from Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon is uh, you're gonna have a lot you know more different Pokemon appear via an island scan. So you're gonna be able to scan the islands for these different Pokemons and stuff. And, you know, within the trailer, we were able to see, like, Charizard, Bulbasaur, Squirtle, you know, a lot of these starters that, uh, you know, from the different generations, so you're going to be able to find and catch. So it's kind of going to be, uh, you're going to be able to find a lot more Pokemon between these two games, so hopefully they'll bring back the actual Pokedex more than just the Alola one. That was one thing that I was hoping they would announce, but... uh have not yet, so I'm assuming so, just because of the fact that we have so many different legendaries and so many different, mm-hmm. you know, things. It would be it would be silly not to. So I'm gonna skip over that point because we already cover it. Yeah. Uh, but this point is pretty interesting. Um, we do have additional dates for the Pokemon the movie I Choose You uh, cinematic release. Um, it's sold out across. Dang it! It's sold out across the U S. Um, with additional dates of November 11th and the 14th. Um, as yeah, well adding as on, adding on to the original dates of November fifth and sixth, so and uh, with that, with the November fifth and sixth dates, if you already got your tickets, um, you're going to get the Pokemon uh, trading card game uh, card featuring Ash's Peach Pikachu wearing uh, the trainer's hat and QR code that unlocks an in-game event, and Ash's Peach Pikachu wearing its trainer's hat in. Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, but that's only during the 5th and 6th showing, so if you did want to still go, you are able to go to the November 11th and 14th show, but uh, 
unless you can find uh, somewhere in the theaters close to you for those events. It's going to be it's going to be pretty hard to find something. So who who knows? <laughs> But eBay is going to be hopping in the next coming weeks. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, but that's pretty much all for our Pokemon news as of right now until we get something new. Uh, on to something a little bit more recent, uh, something we talked about a lot last week, um, Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. Uh, we had a, um, a group of people went and data mined a lot of the website and the app itself, and we kind of got a lot more... Uh, information as to what is to come in the app so definitely some cool things um and kind of one of the first points that they make is there's a lot of references to a possible future garden within your little pocket camp so definitely something that you know you're going to be able to maintain and take care of so that's pretty cool and from you know with that you know you're going to have plants you know that you can plant you know they're going to need to be watered and each of them are going to have a state attached to them so, like, you know, needs to get watered, dying, withered, you know, dead. <laughs> so, and uh, continuing with that, you had the seeds, fertilizers, and flowers. And, you know, in order to have plants, seeds have to be used and fertilized and stuff to that nature. So, and then soil is going to have different states, normal, dry, withered. Um, Animals populate the garden, can be caught. So, you're going to get, like, butterflies and stuff to be able to catch and different insects from there. Um, buds, branches, plant genes, uh, references are everywhere, but there's the use is still inconclusive. So unfortunately, with the data mining, they weren't able to figure out anything from there. Um, there's a form, possibly a form of plant breeding that'd be available once the garden goes live. So gene one and gene two can combine, and you get new result. And that's like just the really regular Animal Crossing games where you gotta kind of put plants next together and just pollinate them to try to get the different colors and stuff so definitely uh something pretty cool to look forward to as well um as well as there's a lot of hints that uh you know garden related items will be purchasable um and you know you're going to be able to visit other people's gardens and uh kind of a cool thing that they're going to leave a little footprints and more if you go and visit someone else's garden so definitely some rewards for that um, facilities that can be found are for school, a shop, snack places, a hospital, restaurants, offices, department heads, hotels, and a hall. Hall, assuming it's like a banquet hall type of a thing, not like a, you know, a hallway. <laughs> so definitely something interesting, you know, something that we kind of saw a little bit in uh, Happy Home Designer. You got a lot of these different places within the main hub world, so we're probably going to be able to see those coming into the app, which is actually a kind of cool callback for those who've played a happy home designer uh glad to be seeing that um as well as some special costumes that uh, they're going to be bringing in as well that they found in data mining uh so those include uh clothes uh hero mario link samus pikmin and clothes arrow and i'm assuming these are um Variable names, they're not necessarily the actual names of these things. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the app is going to support a lot of different weather effects, so special weather for summer and winter, including very fine, fine, cloudy, rainy, heavy rain, snow, heavy snow, uh, fine evening, cloudy evening, fine morning, cloudy morning, summer solstice, and winter solstice. So that's definitely something also to point out, that they are bringing back the solstice days, so that's pretty cool to see that those days are... You know, there's there's still you know, harking back to you know an actual Animal Crossing game where all these things do matter in the game, and you got the little events for that. So, I'm looking forward definitely to be getting this Pocket app. Uh, and I know they have it over in Australia right now, uh, but I, I I'll wait. I will wait. <laughs> You're so, gonna be patient. I'll be patient. I but I, I'm I'm looking. I'm definitely looking forward to it. It's definitely gonna be a good app to have and you know to mess around with and to have fun with because i love my animal crossing so Alrighty. so we've got some more information about uh, project octopath traveler um they did it, that feedback uh so and they kind of gave us the results back with that for all those who did the feedback with the demo so and they had a couple of questions um the first of which was which route did you play in the demo um, a great majority of people played both with 63%. Uh, 
Uh, only 19% chose Primrose only, and only 18% only chose uh, Olberic. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty interesting. It's uh, kind of keeping to the trend of, you know, it's a demo, so people are going to play both paths to kind of get an idea of which one they would prefer when the game actually comes out. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, reviews based on that that uh, demo are generally positive on a five star scale. Thirty two percent rated it with a five. Fifty three percent rated four stars. Twelve at three. Two percent at two, and one percent at one star. Uh, so it's very clear that this game is f- a very good game, but there are definitely some flaws that need to be addressed with it, um, such as uh, improving the movement speed so it could be a little bit faster. Um, some parts of the map are pretty hard to see. Um, people are hoping for a feature to skip certain events, uh, and the menu is a little bit, a uh, little bit inconvenient. So that's probably a te- testament to uh, maybe the UI quality needs to be addressed and real um, revised a bit. This and another kind of thing is you know just a few things that they pointed out uh, that people in the survey said uh, you know they want to be able to get the text a little bit bigger and uh, to try to make battles a little bit more interesting. I don't know. I thought battles were pretty good, I, especially with the mechanic of, you know, you have a multiplication count, you know, counter per each turn that you can, you know, save up and store. Uh, so I thought that, you know, that made uh, battles definitely pretty interesting. So I don't know. Maybe they'll be adding a little bit more into a battle to kind of throw throw some extra elements in there to make it uh, you know, more than just uh, your average RPG. So, definitely something to look forward to when that game finally does come out and we get more information about that, and we'll let you know. I'm, I'm excited for that game. Uh, the demo, I've played... I've only played Old Brick, so I'm part of that 18% right now. Uh, but, uh... I'll be, play, I'll be trying to play uh, more of Primrose, so... Uh, that way I can say I can be part of both but it's, it's been <laughs> become de- the majority. Yeah, but it's definitely been a good game so far. Good demo. Uh, what no. would you, if you were to be, if you were posed the question, what would you rate it out of five? I'd probably give it a four right now. Um, but it'd be a high four. It, it's definitely it's a good demo. Uh, the graphics are very good, but you know, like some of the criticism said, you know, I mo- moving is very slow. Very very slow and. I do want to be able to skip a lot of what people are saying. Like I just, I you know, I, I especially when if you die, you got to go and redo all these scenes. You just can't skip it again. It's like ah, I, I, I've already seen this. I don't care. You know, I want to mm-hmm. go skip it kind of thing. And I think that's going to be something they'll probably implement again. This is a demo and this is a beta, so of course there's something like this. And it's very nice to see something like this because you don't see it very often where a developer actually does release a beta to the public to kind of get feedback about it. Um, so it's nice to see that that that's coming, and it's a really great way to get a lot of feedback on your game. Um, so you have more than just the simple, like, um, you're, it's, it's many minds working on one thing rather than, you know, one singular mind trying to figure out and make sure everything is is perfect. Mm-hmm. So, kind of on to our next topic that uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, me and Chris here just went and saw the Legend of Zelda Symphony of the Goddess uh, here in Detroit at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra Hall. And uh, we're going to kind of talk about our experience with that. Um, the show started, uh, it was November 1st at uh, 7.30 in Orchestra Hall. It was conducted by uh, Kelly Corcoran, who is one of four major uh, conductors that uh, the Zelda Symphony has, as well as uh, Jessica Gethin, uh, uh, Kevin Zerkowski, and Gir Como uh, Lorapino. I'm probably butchering his name, but... <laughs> That's okay. So those are the four directors that kind of go around and do it. But we had Kelly this night, and uh, we got to uh, hear a bunch of different songs. They kind of started out with, uh, you know, the Symphony of the Goddess. They started out with uh, the Overture for 2017, so it kind of had Breath of the Wild. A little bit of everything. A little bit of everything, a lot of Breath of the Wild kind of thrown in there as well. Then they went into a Majora's Mask medley. Then they did a whole segment on Breath of the Wild, 
And then they did kind of like a prelude, which is kind of like the part in Ocarina of Time where they start talking about the goddesses and how mm-hmm. the Triforce was created. Uh, from there, we went into Ocarina of Time and then Wind Waker with a bunch of the different songs. Uh, then from there, you had the intermission that was 15 minutes. Um, then they went into a piece uh, for the Temple of Time. Then Twilight Princess. Um, then the Time of the Falling Rain, which is like a link to the past uh, medley for that. Um, then we had the Battle of the Windfish. And then the conductor left us, but we wanted more. So she came back and did the Goron City medley from uh, Breath of the Wild. So we had a lot of uh, Goron to end the night. So that was pretty cool to have that. So Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the evening. It was a very good show. I will say, though, um, if you have seen a symphony before, uh, a lot of it, if you've been to one before, of course you can go to again, but it's a lot of stuff that we had heard before. Um, but it's nice to hear um, it's nice to hear stuff like that again, and it's uh, playing in the background right now. I don't know which uh, showing this was, but we've got that playing in the background. Um, I have a question for you, Josh, because you have a little bit of more of an ear for it than I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, how was the? Were there any sour notes? And in at any point? No, I between this one and the Columbus I thought these these guys did uh, very well a little bit did a little bit of stuff above the only th- problem I had was uh, at one point the choir sounded a little bit sour during one of I think it was starting out with the Twilight Princess medley uh, but and it could have also been sound management because they yeah. were kind of a little bit overshadowed yeah. uh, by the band I would say mm-hmm. but but. Give and take. It it was a, it's a small venue though mm-hmm. too, so that's something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but overall, very good. I was very happy with it. Brought tears to my eyes at one point. So you know it, that that always makes me happy. So definitely a good uh, good show. If you have not already seen it, you definitely go and find a show near you uh, for the Zelda Symphony. Uh, this is going to be our second showing. We did meet a guy that has gone now five times, and I'm like, geez. Oh, yeah. That's crazy. I, yeah, I was I was listening, and I heard a guy having a conversation with his friend, and he was like, I've been to the Chicago one, the Indianapolis one, two other ones, and then the one that was on Wednesday. So, like, I caught a couple of them that he had been to. So he's pretty much been all over the Midwest to see these shows. Uh, and it just goes to as a testament just to say how fantastic Zelda music is really is mm-hmm. that you'd go and see it five times <laughs> mm-hmm. definitely yes which we'll have to bring up we did have a topic way a couple years ago uh but me and chris had this topic before and maybe we'll bring it up next time uh you know what what has the better music pokemon or zelda so oh man i remember that conversation wow that was a long that's Jeez, that was like what four years ago at, now? At least that so. was a long time ago. So maybe maybe your thoughts have changed. We'll keep that we'll keep that in in mind for another topic. We'll keep that in mind for another topic. We'll see we'll see how. We'll, Cause we'll, now, now that you've been to the Zelda Symphony twice, you know it's it's definitely something that is uh, each each in, has in their own. Un- I will say this: each has their own unique spectrum of enjoyment. I don't I wouldn't say that I dislike either of them, but mm. it's going to be something that I'll have to we'll have to wait and see what the uh, Pokemon, Pokemon Symphony does. sounds like cuz once we get through there and once we get through that, we'll be able to uh, talk about that and see how that goes. So we have uh, one we'll do this topic real quick and then we'll pause for our station identification. Um, so the the next topic we got to talk about is uh, Super Mario Odyssey. Uh, with its release being last week, it has sold uh, 1.1 million copies up until Wednesday. So the first five days of release, it sold 1.1 million in North America. So it's the fastest selling Mario game ever. And over in Japan, it sales for the Switch have increased four times what they Good were Lord. for this game. And they're still having issues in Japan. They're still doing lotteries, I know this. Mm-hmm. It, oh, good lord. Yes, and within uh, worldwide, within three days, 
the game itself sold over 2 million copies. And that's just within three days, so worldwide. So, I mean, America did do pretty well within five days for a million, but, I mean, over, you know, just ba you're basically doubling that for the worldwide release, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and it is one of the best-reviewed games of all times. Metacritic has it the seventh highest of all time, and uh, another reviewer uh, on game ranking has it as its number one game of all time. So this game is praiseable, beyond relief. Definitely from what I've played, I've enjoyed it so much. It is it is so fun finding power moons, and the story is very good, and it, it doesn't feel like, you know, the, the power moons, it, you have to have skill in order to find these power moons. It, you know, some of them. You definitely have to, you know, the, the developers knew that, you know, if you're keeping a keen eye out, you're going to be able to find these moons. And if you're not keeping a keen eye out, you're not going to get all 999, you know. I mean, if you're not going to be a completionist, that's fine. But, you know, this game really, really wants you to be a completionist. Uh, it just, uh, it, I mean, it doesn't push it in a hole necessary, but it's it, it's something that it's like, oh, there's like, there's 20 other moons here? What? I can't find them. Oh, jeez, i got to go find them. It's, it's definitely something to, that, that keeps you coming back and saying, Oh wait, hey, there's something else. I was watching someone stream it. I was watching Matt Pat stream it the other day, and I'm like, oh crap, he just found like two other moons that I could not, that I, I had no <laughs> idea were there. I'm like, wait, what, what? So this, you know, it's making me want to go back and say, hey, you know, this is crazy. Definitely something uh, that you're definitely gonna want to play over and over again, especially with. Uh, Wearing uh, different costumes at the end because the ending dialogue with Bowser oh, actually changes. Pause, we'll pause that moment for just a second because I have a topic. Talking about the reviews, I kind of want to talk about. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, I kind of watched a YouTube video the other day from Nintendo Life. Uh, shout out to those guys. Those guys are fantastic. I love their their uh, their YouTube videos. Um, and they were talking about uh, the reviews. And there were some people that literally were reviewing the game with like low scores just to bring the average down. And it's just, it's ludicrous that you're trying to do that because, okay, you, it, it, do, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Really, no, those like are people, rather those than are just people getting trying to get attention. So yeah, it's, it's just like it's like, but on the same effect, it's like rather than you know just saying zero because you 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 think it's not a popular game and you think it shouldn't. Well, give it the score that you think it should have, not the score that you want to bring the average down with. Mm -hmm. It's no. just those are just people trying to get attention. Just ignore them. <laughs> it's, it's just a, it's a, it's the same stupid reason with IGN or whoever it was that did seven point eight out of ten or whatever for the. And we're still talking about that. Yeah. That was three years ago now. Yes, for uh, Oris. Uh, Oris, yeah. Yes, Pokemon Oris. So I mean, oh, here's my know. favorite tune in all of Zelda. So, I mean, but definitely, it's still one of the best ga reviewed games of all times, and it, it does deserve its praise. It is a very good game, keeps you entertained for hours and hours, and like I was saying beforehand, the ending dialogue with Bowser does change based on your outfit, like if you're wearing Luigi's outfit, Peach's wedding dress, Bowser's wedding outfit, the invisible cap, or the skeleton costume are just kind of some examples that kind of changes up the dialogue, so it's kind of cool to see that Nintendo is kind of looking at, you know, your options while you're playing and saying, hey, you know, let's change up a couple things, let's do that, that's pretty cool. And speaking of, uh, you know, some different ways to play, um, actually using the Amiibo of Peach kind of gives you a little bit of a cheat sheet uh, to go ahead and go through, because the Peach Amiibo gives you an you know additional three parts to your life bar, and, um, you can pretty much use that amiibo whenever you want. So you know if you you know so instead of having you know if you lose your part to have six parts for your heart and you're in the middle of a boss battle, just tap in that amiibo and hey, you got another one. It's like well, okay. I me thinking about it, I was thinking oh no, they do it once a day thing. No, no, definitely not. You can you can pretty much just teach through the game using Peach amiibo, which is pretty funny. But you know benefits those who uh, have the amiibos. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now we're probably going to take just a little break for some station identification and some other stuff. So we're going to do that in just a second here. All righty. Give me one sec. I've got it all queued up, ready to go. So, um, Josh, if you don't mind pausing the music for just a second for me. 
Um, and then I will go ahead and um, start that drop real quick. So once that music pauses, I'll start playing the playing the drop. You are listening to Nintendo's on WUMD. All right, and welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank you for being so patient with that uh, that temporary drop. Uh, it's very nice of you guys to uh, listen in this morning and listen to that. So we are back. We are live. I'm going to give the um, the little chord for Josh back again so we can have that beautiful music playing in the background once more, and we'll launch into our next topic. All right, so our next major topic is, of course, um, Nintendo sales. So this is a pretty interesting uh, topic to be talking about. Will you stop falling down there? I have a piece of paper that just doesn't want to stay on the table. Stay. Okay. So kind of starting out with sales, you have the sales for the Super Famicom slash SNES, uh, and that is actually over 2 million were sold uh, over the... uh, They were tracking this over the month of September, and as of September, the Switch has sold over 7.63 million units, uh... Which, and funny, which, looking at the software, too, they sold 27.48 million units. Uh, and <laughs> looking at that, compared to the Wii U... In its entire lifetime. It has sold m- more than half. The Wii U has sold 13.56 million units. And this for software, it was at 10.85. So, I mean, software, obviously, right now... One, it, 100.85. Oh yes, sorry. 100.85 million units uh, for the for the Wii, Wii U's uh, software sales, uh, and the Switch. It's it's a pretty much it's seven. So for every one unit that has been sold, approximately seven. There's approximately seven games mm-hmm. on every single Switch system across on average for every Switch that's sold. There's about seven games. With the Wii U, there was only about maybe 10 on average, a little bit more than 10 on average for every... Or, excuse me, a little bit less than 10 mm-hmm. on average for uh, all of the software sales for, for the Wii U. So you, you're kind of seeing that that uh, the numbers are quickly starting to uh, reflect how how those that popularity has been. Um, so and, and comparatively, you know, throughout the lifetime of the 3DS, you have the hardware selling at uh, 68.98 million units, um, and the software at 343.07 million units. So I mean, you know, comparatively, you know, I mean, the 3DS has been around for a lot longer. Uh, you know, that one's going to be, you know, that's a lot of Nintendo's major sellers, a lot of their handheld stuff. So mm-hmm. we're kind of seeing that a lot now already coming around with the Switch at 7.63 million, which is and and really, if you Crazy. think about it, the 3DS wasn't out for much longer than the Wii U was. So really, realistically, if you think about it, through all the the Wii U's, you know, quote unquote failures, the 3DS was keeping Nintendo afloat. So I mean, in reality, they understood that they had something that wasn't really working. So they kept one thing that was established and already well known. And you have that with the 3DS and the many iterations thereof. I mean, there's. I, there's every flavor of, of 3DS that you can practically buy these days. If you want a, an old uh, Game Boy Advance style 3DS, you can go get the original first gen 2DS. If you want a, a, a DS that can play 3DS games, you get a new 3D or new 2DS XL. If you want the 3D, you get a regular 3DS, you get a 3DS XL, or you get the new 3DS XL. Mm-hmm. Or you get one of those exclusive bundles that they have. Um, because apparently you can only buy a regular sized new 3DS in a bundle in North America. Hmm. If you're elsewhere, you can get them wherever, wherever you, you want. Or sad. But even still, looking at all these, it's it's still pretty crazy to even just think within the first year of the Switch's lifetime, it has already sold over half of what the Wii U did. So sad to see that one go, but it's uh, it's funny at the same time. It's like, well, Nintendo just bounces back. They always do. So, and kind of looking at some sales around the world, um, the Switch is actually the best-selling system in Canada this year. Uh, the system, as of September, has already sold uh, um, 209,000 uh, units, and Nintendo has held a 73% share of console sales in Canada within the last month. So everyone's buying Nintendo over there, and uh, 
During September, the company sold uh, 115,000 units between the Switch, the 3DS, and the SNES Classic. So, I mean, Canada is definitely eating up Nintendo right now, which is which is pretty good. I mean, it's it's funny just to say that you know, uh, within a country that is still pretty big, uh, Nintendo is number one there. Mm-hmm. So. And Switch hardware is actually has an increase in the forecast of its sales, um, considering that they initially had a 10 million um, 10 million unit forecast. They have upped that to 14 million, uh, given the light of the popularity of the Switch, and it makes sense, um, really realistically. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next coming weeks, and especially with Black Friday, we'll see that uh, increase even more. Mm-hmm. And the software forecast has increased to 50 million units from 35 million originally. So definitely, uh, you know, they're expecting great things out of the Switch, and I I hope it surpasses all of it. Mm-hmm. So indeed. Um, so the total sales um, in in a dollar amount is uh, 374 billion yen, um, of which the overseas sales were about 272.3 or about 72.8% of the total sales uh, of that. Uh, so that's about um, approximately 3.7 uh, billion U.S. dollar. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's an incredible amount of money. Um, so the operating profit uh, came to be about three, 39.9 billion yen. Um, so the original, uh, the original profit was 69.5 billion yen, but that profit is kind of attributed to the owners of the patent, um, which kind of reached 51.5 billion yen. Um, so, of course, that's about four, that's about four billion in, uh, or excuse me, about four, about 400, 400 million, uh, 600 and, or 700 million, and uh, 500 million uh, U.S. dollar, respectively. So, and kind of continuing on the success of the Switch, um, there are over 300 different software uh, publishers, uh, you know, including the you know, indie developers right now that have you know begun developing titles for the game, you know, for their games on the Switch. So definitely something that you know we have we have a bunch of games that are going to be coming out. There there are enough people, um, you know, and the purchase intent is trending upward, not only among children and families in their 30s, but among, you know, junior and senior high school students, college students, you know, consumers in their 20s of both genders, so I mean, it's not mutually exclusive to anyone, um, you know, kind of within, you know, the buyers, age and genders, uh, we have a little infograph here that we're looking at, I mean, yeah, you have 86% that are male, uh, 11% uh, female, 3% didn't answer to that. Um, and you have a lot of people between the ages oh. of uh, 25 and 34. 43 percent of these people did that did this like little uh, uh, survey. So it, the switch is very much a young adult, active go getter, you know, on the move type of a system. Because really, if you look at it, five percent of the sales have been for people who are, uh, or five percent of the use is 12 and under. Five percent is kids in junior high. Seven percent is people in high school, um, and then a measly twenty percent is our age group, nineteen to twenty-four. But the big group, and I, t- I think this isn't a testament to the marketing of the switch. Forty-three percent are twenty-five to thirty-four. Seventeen percent are just above that in the thirty to forty, thirty-five to forty-five range, and a small three percent are over the age of forty-five. Um, the, that is that is a very interesting spread, and it is it it uh, kind of busts that myth that Nintendo is a kids thing, because really realistically, you see the big group is the 25 to 34s. Mm-hmm. Those kind of people are definitely not kids. Mm-hmm. They might be kids at heart, but they're definitely not kids. But and still kind of con- continuing with that, you know, you, you, they're definitely hitting the right age group. Um, but of course, developer EA is kind of being a little, a little mean. Being uh, a bunch of jerks. Uh, they basically spoke to the Wall Street Journal, and you know their chief financial guy Blake uh, Jorkinson said that EA is pretty much waiting until the Switch has been out a full year before really deciding whether to bring more over more games, and claims it's too early to 
you know tell whether or not FIFA 18 has been a success on the Switch, and they fully want to understand what uh, you know the demand is for the Switch and the system before additional they commit additional resources. But I'm like I'm th- I'm looking at that comment from EA, and I'm like, do do you not see the sales? Do you, do you not know what it just did? You know, surpassing over half of what the Wii U sold. Are are you not seeing any of this? Are are you crazy? Mm-hmm. I think you're crazy. You, you know, you're basing it yeah. off of your little soccer game that mm-hmm. you're going to upcharge people with microtransactions and stuff. EA, stop being uh, money grubbing, uh, stupid people that uh, just claim DLC for everything that you need because that's not how that's not how we want to play games. We're not, I'm not giving you money. I didn't give you money for Battlefront. I'm not giving you money for anything else unless. You know, of course, it's you know it's well intended and worth it, and full of a full game that you know DLC is just extra. You know, and it's it's frustrating, and and really you're kind of you're kind of preaching to the choir because you know EA is a very the 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 company just doesn't operate very well. Their their practices are not something that are somebody would enjoy. It's really one of those things that it it's just like EA being EA at this point. And, you know, they just got to get their, their head out of their butts. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just so. kind of just start working on, you know, not being what they are and trying to improve you know, their their perspective on, on the, the gaming yeah. sphere. Yep. The Switch, but more the gaming you sphere in game. general. Yeah. Because they've always been a horrible company. There have been things that they've bought out, and because they were mostly successful, and they canceled them entirely because they didn't produce the sales that they had seen before. So, I mean, it, it's just EA is kind of like it is a very, very backwards company. I just it it bothers me that they they still make the money that they do because of their their sports games. Mm-hmm. Well, that's only where they're getting all our money from, but I don't know. On to kind of uh, a little bit uh, of another topic. Uh, they kind of get Nintendo kind of gave us an infographic about like how a lot of people play, um, you know, their, with their Switch versus docked versus undocked. You had about um, looks like about twenty five. It's a very 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 subtle shift in the color because this mm-hmm. is a monochrome. Uh, printout, but there's a very small shift right around 23 to 25 percent. That that they play in the dock mode primarily, um, and then you have uh, a huge majority playing in both modes, which is actually really cool. I'm glad to, you know, you have probably like what about 45 percent. So playing in both modes, and then you have about 30 percent just playing in undocked mode. So you know, you have a lot of different people that are, uh, you know using this switch on the go and moving around with it so i mean definitely you know what the switch was intended for so glad mm-hmm. to see that you know a lot of people are still doing that and playing in both modes and you know i still find myself every now and again i mean i've been playing docked m- more often than not but with today i have my switch with me we'll be going to yomacon uh, and i'll have that i have that with me so i'll be primarily playing in uh, portable mode but mm-hmm. hey it's a thing it's it's nice and uh, that'll be interesting to do. So, kind of one of our last topics that we wanted to talk about. Uh, we got some words from Reggie, some quotes. Uh, me and Chris are going to bounce back and forth about what he's kind of said with a lot of stuff. Um, with kind of the first thing he said, uh, quote: uh, "We are fortunate that the Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild is was far along in development. Uh, you know, basically starting talking about you know the launch of the Switch." And he said it could be an anchor title for the day one launch perspective. And then you have Super Mario Odyssey as the key game going into the holiday. It was, on one hand, quite well planned, but the other piece is that it always comes down to the development schedule, which I kind of agree with him. So, but I mean, they they did you know comparatively to the Wii U, they did you know they had a great launch title, and they have you know games throughout the year that have kept sales going for the Switch, as, you know especially with Odyssey 4 here for the holiday season for the people that uh, want their Switch. This is definitely a game to go and get. So, mm-hmm. 
Um, and then his second quote was, uh, we are a company that always takes chances. We are fortunate in that oftentimes those chances and risks win the marketplace, but sometimes they don't. It, but it's at, but at its heart, we believe in differentiated experiences. So you kind of see that with, you know, especially with the point where he says sometimes those risks don't work out. The Wii U is a good example of that. And it's because they, they tried to do something new, granted, but the way that they marketed it and the way that they brought it out, it kind of sunk it from the beginning. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, even even you and I, I think back when the, it was first announced, I think even you and I thought that it was an add-on for the Wii. Mm-hmm. So, but no, they, n- n- Nintendo learns from their mistakes, and uh, they're definitely uh, giving a lot of go for the Switch, so glad with that. Kind of on the collaboration with Universal, uh, uh, the park down in... Uh, Florida, uh, Reggie Gunny said um, it's a very active collaboration. Uh, the folks at Universal understand theme parks and theme park technology better than anyone else in the world and Nintendo understands their intellectual property and they understand what makes them uh, you know, fun and better than anyone in the world and that's what collaboration is making uh, what's making this special so you're t- you know, taking two great things together, you, know, you got Universal and Nintendo and they're making their park, and it's definitely going to be something that everyone's going to be excited for, and definitely something that I'm going to have to definitely uh, take a vacation to and go and see Nintendo mm-hmm. Land. So, and then on the Switch needing a backup feature, uh, Richie says, "Quote: You're looking, you're talking to someone who has completed 120 shrines, and I think I'm at 400 Korok seeds and growing in Breath of the Wild." So I understand what it's like putting a lot of time into content and the thought of that content not being there. We're aware of the concern. It's an area that we're going to continue working on to make sure that we can alleviate some of the consumer fears of having a content-based issue. So I think that's just kind of thing that, you know, they're going to get the, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of talking about this with the Nintendo network. They're just, you know, as soon as we start paying for online stuff, I have a feeling that they'll kind of launch with that in terms of a backup system into yeah. somewhere where we can, you know, keep our memory just to make sure that, you know, if something does were to happen with our Switch that we have that there. So I think that's just going to be with the, you know, little pay for the three hours a month that you're going to pay for the online stuff. I think that's going to be part of that. So something to look forward to eventually down the line. Mm-hmm. So. And it's something even the concern still exists that we have. I mean, with the 3DS, you've still got that issue of, you know, that stuff's still local, and nobody seems to have an issue about that. So, I mean, it's a nice it's nice that they're considering it, but it's also something that, for me, it's not necessarily a concern. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily a concern for me, but I see where people come from with that. Because, you know, you've got a lot of digital titles. You've got a lot of stuff that you sunk into. It'd be a shame if you lost it. It really would. Mm-hmm. Um, so... You want to take a couple minutes and talk about, uh, you know, anticipations and kind of expectations of Yomicon? Uh, I mean, it's not on the script, but we can talk about it, kind of get an idea of what we want to do, maybe. Or <laughs> I'm, I'm going in uh, blind. I'm, I'm just expecting uh, to have some fun, meet some mm-hmm. cool people, see some cool cosplays. Uh, well, one of you're going to be with one of them today. Yep, so it's going to be... Something pretty cool to look forward to, and we'll talk about that a little bit next week as well. Mm-hmm. So talk I'd about our experiences and such. Uh, don't walk too fast, by the way, because I, I can't move very fast in my cosplay. So, all right. All righty. Well, that's... Uh, uh, I was going to say we could talk about uh, talk about the show, but uh, or talk about Yomicon, but I guess we'll uh, wrap we'll, the we'll show say, up we'll at this point. We'll save that for next week. Yep, sounds like a plan to me. All right, so uh, that... That concludes our show for the week. Um, it was fantastic that everybody listened in. Uh, do apologize for the delay. Um, we had kind of some unforeseen circumstances that cropped up that we didn't kind of we didn't anticipate. So uh, do apologize for uh, starting a little late and finishing a little late as well. Uh, but thank you for sticking out. And uh, as always, I'm Chris and I'm Josh and we are the Nintendo Bros. Remember to game on, everybody.